We live in a benefit-oriented society. When someone will be offered a new job, most likely in the interview there would be a question asked, what is there in this for me? What's the benefit? What can I get out, out of that? We, we have been raised in a benefit. Many of the parents also use this approach to get the children to, to obey, to do chores or something. Some friends also deal, can you make me a favor? But in the back of their minds is, okay, I'm making you a favor, but sometime you will make me a favor too. So there's a benefit uh, to, to gain. That's, that's the way uh, we are. But God understands that, and he has given us promises, sure promises, wonderful promises, the greatest benefits, benefit ever. And many people don't realize that as they search for what's in it for me somewhere else, they are missing out on the most important benefit of all benefits. In this series, we have been uh, st studying about abide in me and I in you. I will abide in you. And that's the part this morning that I want to stress. This privilege, this mouth falling, oh, awesome uh, expression, I promise I will be with you and how important it is to, to us. Everything that you and I need, we can w find it waiting in the presence of the Lord. The greatest treasure ever. You can win the world, Jesus says, but still lose your souls. If you hold on to something, you will lose something else. Like if of this world, if you hold on to this world, you will lose something from the world to come. So Jesus is telling us many, many ways the same, same thing. So this morning, we only look at uh, slide number two quickly, just as a way of review. The vine dresser is working, he's pruning, he's looking for uh, signs of fruitfulness. If we don't abide in him and we cannot bear fruit, we are useless. If we have show signs of fruitfulness, he will prune us so that we may give some more fruits. Go to slide number three. This will be our text that I want to stress to this morning. Many, many ways of many Bible version to read it. Let's read it aloud if you want with me. Abide in me and I in you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. Stay joined to me and I will stay joined to you. Remain united to me, and I will remain united to you. Live in me, and I will live in you. Different ways to say it, but it's so it's special to, to see sometimes so that the meaning of coming clearer on that. The, the verb abide in me or remain in me is an imperative. It's like you must. It's like a command. You must. This is essential. And Jesus repeated also in verse 7 in the same way. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, this is what I'm going to do. I will. I will. You, can, you have so many uh, promise of that. So the first benefit, the most extraordinary benefit, is to have God in us. God among us. God's blessing being part of our daily life, of what we do. God cares for who you are, as you are, where you are, what you do. As I said last week, and everything you do and everything you see, when you eat or drink, do it all for the glory of God. And the little tiny things that doesn't seem to be important, if it is done in the glory of the Lord, if it is done with the presence of the Lord to anoint it, everything becomes extraordinary. Everything becomes important to the Lord. And we need to, to realize these things this morning. Jesus promised in the I will or I and you, uh, there is a promise, a, a secure promise, a guarantee, a pledge from his, from his side. See, there is two sides. Your side and the side of Jesus. Jesus tell you and tell me, if you abide, if you choose that, if you seek for that, if you desire it, if you stay with me, connected to me, no matter what's going to happen, trouble, difficulties, up and down, it doesn't matter if you stick to me. Because if you realize the rest of the chapter is going to talk, the world will hate you as they hated me. 
they will persecute you as they persecuted me. So that, that, that's, there's a context. Jesus is going away. They are staying and they are going to face the opposition of the world. If you abide, if you remain, if you stay connected to me, my presence will be with you as well. So that's something that we need to know. But it is unbelievable that this great privilege, God with us, God with me, God in me, that we will not take more advantage of that. It is unbelievable that many Christians rarely or, or never exercise this wonderful privilege. This is, I think, the greatest privilege given to man. Okay, okay, do, do you see it? Do you, do you get it? But why is it that we rarely exercise this great privilege? Each day believers say no without realizing it. If you don't, you, it's like you're saying no to the privilege and the invitation of God of and living, of dwelling, of expecting, of desiring this. It's like saying no to God's fellowship. And instead we will choose to spend our time searching for other things, uh, wasting our time many times with something that will never satisfy. Uh, Jeremiah said it like this. Indeed, my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, number one. Number two, they have dug cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. And this is often what we, we do. Either we will remain in him, the source of living water, or we will forsake this, and then we will do dig our own ways, and we will look for our own answers to our problems without going to the source, without going to the source of wisdom. We will consult friends, colleagues. Uh, we used to consult self-help self book, but now not many of us have books. We consult Google. <laughs> Let me ask you a question, and it's not to, to, to condemn, it's just like uh, you will see, oh yeah, yeah. Have you ever had a sickness and you went to Google to see the same terms, recognize it, how to cure it, and how to face it. That's what we do now. We all go, I, I do it, you, you do it too. We go. And let me make uh, something very clear here this morning. Everything you read on Facebook is absolutely true. No. no. Oh, okay, okay, I'm surprised. I thought it was all true. Everything, everything. So we spend our time digging, searching, thinking, accepting humanistic views from the left and to the right, political uh, opinions of, of everybody. You know, the human mind is, is a fantastic uh, creation. It always search and it's never satisfied. Is that true? You always think of something. We cannot accept to, to remain uh, you know, quiet and to pause. It's like, boom, we just get on Google, do something, cannot wait, get on the phone. Uh, we have to search for something. It's never quiet. Maybe God, through this text, is telling us, push the pause button. Pause your mind. Stop for one night. You know, Jesus talked to uh, uh, Martha and Mary. Martha, Martha, why are you so, uh, the word that he used is like the mind is filled with all sorts of worries and distractions. Your mind is, is filled of so certain things. Uh, sit down with Mary for a while. Go and listen and get some, something from me. And we, we need, we need to, to go back to, to that. This is really, really important. There's a preacher who puts it in this way. To not live in daily contact with God is not only sinful, it's stupid. I will apply it to myself because I don't want to insult anybody of you in this room by the word stupid. I will say it to me, okay? To not live in daily contact with God is not only sinful, because it's selling God, it's, you're not really that important to me. I, I don't have time for you, I'm not that interested. I can go on on my way. We don't realize these things, we just do it. And then but he says, it's stupid also because I'm not going to get any peace, I'm not going to get anything uh, of importance by neglecting. Jesus said it in the same way here, in his own words. If a man abides not 
That's the same thing of what has, I've been uh, uh, telling you about. There's a mountain of truth in this little statement, and there is so much we miss if we neglect it. And the most important way that uh, Jesus is teaching us in John chapter 15 about dwelling in him and remaining in him is using the word of God. This, we repeat it all the time. You have heard it a million times, but it is so, so true. In the beginning, next slide. In the beginning was the word, the word, the logos, the message of God was God. When you receive the message of the Lord, you receive the expression of God. It's like having God uh, with you, the presence of the Lord, the, the, the universe of the Lord, the worldview of the Lord is, is being, uh, coming to you. It's, it's an invitation to come to you. The word was God. Human beings cannot live on bread alone, but need every word that God speaks. This is what we need. This is what we need for life. When the Israelites came into the land, this is in Deuteronomy chapter 8 that Jesus quotes from. When you will have homes, when you will reap your harvest, when you will be improving your life, when you will prosper. Remember, man cannot live of the, uh, the, the bread alone, but of the word of the Lord. That's the, the relationship with the Lord. You know, I'm not talking about, and, and you, you know that you have experience just like me. For myself, I have two ways to do my quiet time with the Lord. The rush and don't care way, because I'm, I'm in a hurry and my mind is not really into it, but I feel that I have to because I'm a Christian and I'm a pastor, then I must read my Bible, absolutely. Okay? So I can do it fast, 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 and at the door. Will I receive a lot of that? Or I can choose to prepare myself with expectation and then I, I want, I pray and I want to read and my heart is already prepared. It's already receptive. And then there's something in that morning that will keep me. So what happened when you read the words with a quality time together, with a heart preparation, with the desire to hear the Lord to receive something fresh from the Lord, a manna for today. There's a difference from the way that I described before. The Word of God will feed your spirit and will continue His work after you close it and you close your door and you go out to work, this word that you have put into you, this living word, this rima of God, this promise that God spoke to you, this peace that he has given to you, or, or this warning, or this word of corrections, or this warning that you will meet you, your horrible boss, and uh, he's going to be mean to you. But the word of God has already prepared you in patience and kindness and, uh, and humility, and then you go. The word is closed. But it continues its work as you are entering into facing your horrible boss. And this pressure, the word of God has this. The presence of the Lord, the logos of the Lord is closed, but it's in here in your heart and it's, it's working. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. We need God's presence. Do you need God's presence this morning? Yes. Moses is telling us that we need uh, God's presence. You remember when after the golden calf, God was angry and told Moses, Exodus 33, he, he says, go up to this land that flows with milk and honey. Oh, that's wonderful. That's a wonderful promise. But I will not travel with you. You are too stubborn. I'm not going. Otherwise, I will destroy you. Wow, that's a problem right there. Go to the, to the land, but I'm not going with you. And Moses panicked. Moses knew without the, the, the presence of the Lord, it's useless. We are nothing. We cannot make it. He is the one who opened the, 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 the Red Sea. He's the one that brought water from the rock. He's the one that uh, brought the manna. He's the one that brought the quails. He's the one that, that gave him everything that they need. Show them the way to go. So Moses says, if you don't go, I don't go. Don't, don't make us leave oh, over here. That's what we, we read. Don't make us leave this place. Moses knew that God's presence is what set the people of Israel apart. And you and I, the church of Jesus Christ, we should know that this is what 
distinguish the Church of Jesus Christ from whatever is called church, dead cathedrals from the past, or or uh, or scandals or the uh, w with the priests and the children and sex scandals of a pastors with the secretary or the pastor who lives with uh, the, the the money of the church or whatever bad things that we have heard that comes from supposedly the church or the Christians. There are things that happen like that, but Jesus is Moses is teaching us this not should be like that. It should not be like that. The true church of Jesus Christ, the only thing that sets us apart and make us be the church. By this, Jesus says, you prove to be my disciple. By this, you prove to be my disciple. So there is a, a proof and evidence of proving. And this is the presence, the anointing of the Lord with us. If we don't have that, we have only our mind, our flesh, our human experience, our, our worldview. We have nothing to really go forward in this world, to distinguish us and, and bring the glory of the Lord seen through me. Because I'm just the same as anybody else. My mind is the same. Moses didn't care about how the other nations received guidance, their political systems. He didn't care about their strategies, their, their armies. He knew that without the presence of God, we are helpless. That's all he cared about. So then he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord answered him. If you click the next one, we reply to the most. I will indeed do what you have asked, for I look favorably on you. And I know by name, I know you by name. This expression, I know you by name, is equivalent to remain in me. Because I know you by name, there's a relationship. If I know you by name, it means you have come to me. We have a relationship. I know you in a much deeper uh, way. So, so Mo Moses received the approval of God over his life, the blessing. God that says, I'm not going with you. Here he says, okay, I will go with you. You see, there's a difference. And the difference is Moses, God says, I know you by name. You have remained. You have remained connected. Moses could have said, okay, God, it's okay, don't come. We will do it on our own. We are one million, uh, I think, uh, actually in numbers, I think they are 600,000 military men. We will depend on our 600,000 military men of the 11 tribes of Israel, except the Levites. No, he says, if, if you don't come with us, don't make us leave this place. And God says, okay, you have found favor in my eyes. Why? Because you have remained in me. You have remained connected to me. Same, it's the same message as John chapter 15 that Jesus is telling us. I want you in my life, otherwise you can do nothing. Amen? Hallelujah. Neither can you accept you remain in you. Except you remain in you. Hallelujah. And he said, my presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest. And the word rest here is not only like, uh, you know, uh, a place to sleep, but it's, it's more, it's, it's like a, a place to abide. It's like a, a, a peaceful home, a place of safety, a guarantee of protection. I will give you, I will go with you, and I will give you this, this rest from all the other nations because they were on a journey to this land. They are going to pass through uh, enemy territories. I will be with you. I will. Actually, the, the, the terminology is my face, plural, will go. That's what it says. My face will go. That's all you need. My face will go. With my face will go, then you will have whatever you need, a place to dwell, a place of safety, a place to remain. God will remain. No matter what enemies or trials you face, you'll always be able to find a quiet rest in me. And that is true in any storm of life that you will ever face, you and your family, with your children. You know, there's a saying, for those who have young children, small children, small problem. Big children, big problem. I don't want to scare you, but uh, you better uh, be ready for, for what's coming ahead. Hallelujah. I remember that this morning a message from Sister Mary preached in Lighthouse a few years back. Hold on, it's going to be a rough ride. And this is what life is about. And if the presence and the blessing of Jesus is not uh, providing the way, 
the safety, the, the blessings and the anointing, we have nothing to, to, to win. Uh, David said it in this way, Surely your goodness and unfailing love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell, I will remain in, with the presence of the Lord in the house of the Lord. Amen. I will give you rest. Hallelujah. Think about this. When the manifest presence of the Lord is in our midst. You know, you go to church, the presence of the Lord is in our midst. We are not going to rush. We're not going to let our mind be scattered. We're not going to be anxious. You rest, you come here, you feel the peace of God. You sing the song, the songs that includes promises. We sang many promises this morning of God. It has an effect over us. It's not like rushing through, take the offering, three songs, a small sermon, and go. It's a place where we can pray. It's a place where we can relax. You can stay here after. This is a house of prayer. You can talk to the pastors. We can pray for one another. This is a place of calm, of peaceful presence of the Lord. And when people come in, they can feel it. They can feel it. Can you feel it? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Ah, hallelujah. Praise God. A church that feels the presence of the Lord will move forward in quiet confidence. You remember our financial crisis in November, December, when it was presented to the church? We could have chosen to panic because it was kind of a panicking situation. We're going in a diff continual deficit, but it's not anymore. Why? Because instead of cutting, cutting, and changing, and panicking, and stopping everything, why do we exist? Who are we serving? Who is our head? Who do we depend upon? Are we relying on him or panicking about our, our situations? And through prayer and through faith, all together, we move forward in God's peace and our situation has been stabilized. Thank you very much. Because your faith, our faith has moved forward. It's, it's a miracle. It's, it's really a miracle. I don't know that. I, I mean it. And you should say, wow, again this morning. Because wow. it's, it's, really, it's really a miracle. <laughs> Pastor David Wilkerson, when the purchase, uh, Brook, uh, not Brook Center, but I called the uh, Times Square Church. Imagine Times Square Church in a theater in downtown New York. It's the most expensive, probably, uh, land and property to, to buy. This is impossible. He's just like an ordinary pastor who walks in. And he tells the, the story when he walked into this famous Broadway's producer's office. When he walked in, and he is the, the small pastor that he was, the staff and the secretary laughed at him. And he was sure he would never get to talk to this manager over there. But finally, he, he could get an appointment. And after a few weeks, they got to know each other. And uh, the manager looked across the desk and was telling him, because they met multiple times, says, I don't know why I'm spending so much time with you. I'm so busy. But he felt, he, felt, he felt something. And when David Wilkerson would come, every time he would come, his secretaries pushed me past all other visitors, saying, go right in, Reverend. He's waiting for you. That, that's, that's the difference. And then finally, they sold this famous uh, Times Square theater for the church to, to become. And uh, the man, when he, he, he signed, he says, I don't know why I'm doing this. I let you buy this property and I'm signing the deed unto you. It was God's presence that moved. You know, nothing is impossible when God is, is moving ahead. For you who have business or you are jobless, it just, just hold on and remain. And, uh, you know, you have something with God going on. You know, I saw God change people's heart as well. And then later on, they went to the owner's next door because they needed maybe office or other, other rooms. And this man refused to s sell to them this other building. But later on, again, he became a friend with him. And all along, he kept telling me, somebody up there is working for you. 
And this is what we need as a church, somebody up there working for you. But more than that, somebody inside of us, somebody in our midst, somebody that is part of, of what we are part of him. He is part of us. We don't distinguish. God attached a condition to his presence, though, because as we have read in the text here, abide in me if you there is this you your side you abide i am ready i'm always because that's what that, that's the assurance that we have and i will that that's the natural result that that is what he's waiting for he's faithful he's committed he's been waiting he's there waiting for your side to be fulfilled. You fulfill your side, I'm already, I was there all along, I was here waiting for you. Why, why did it take so long to, to come to me? And that's, that's why. So another example of that, the, when King Asa in Second Chronicle uh, is meeting uh, an army of one million troops, that's what the Bible says, one million. That's a lot of people, one million troop army to face with a little army not well equipped like they had. Because until that time when this king came, the country was in a mess. So this king comes, the country is in a mess, and he is facing an army of one million people. So what did they do? They cry out to the Lord, this prayer. Lord, there is none like you to help between the mighty and the weak, or depending on which versions, whether with many, or with those who have no power. And that is very comforting for you and for me this morning. God doesn't need a big army. God doesn't need the, the rich people of this world only to, to do something. He will use them if they want to abide. He will bless them if they want to abide. The, the promise is for everybody that will fulfill their condition. But God is able to help the weak He's able to help the small army without the resources. Do you feel better this morning? That God is able to transform a big problem that you cannot because your resources are too weak or too uh, not available. He is able. With big or small. With strong or weak. With rich or poor. God is able. Amen. Amen. God is able and he is on your side and he loves you. Help us, O oh Lord our God, for we are depending on you, for we are connecting to you, for we are choosing to remain in you and trust in you. God says, okay, I can work with you. I can, I can, I can, I can do it. Then the prophet Azaria met them at the city gate with this message from, from God. The next one, yeah, this one. Hear me, Asa, King Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Just stop there for a moment and compare John 15.2 to 2 Chronicles 15.2. It says the same thing. Remain united to me. I will remain united to you. The Lord is with you while you are with him. But then the second part when it says, if you forsake me, he will forsake you, is the same as saying, if a man abides not in me, unless he abides in me, except he abides in me. It's the same thing. You abide, there's a result. There's a type of relationship, a work that God is going to do that will glorify God. That will be supernatural. That will be something that the life, abundant life of Christ. This is what is expected. Then you abide not. Then you neglect. Then you drift away. Then you forsake the Lord. Of course, the Lord, okay, let me clarify something for you. When it says the Lord will forsake you, it doesn't mean that the Lord is abandoning you. Because there's something in the Bible that is conditional and something that is unconditional. The love of God is unconditional. God is love. God so loved the world. God has proven his love for us. But while we were yet sinners, he died for us. So there's no problem. Nothing will separate us from the love of Christ. These are certainties. These are unconditional. But many of the promises of the Lord comes with conditions. And most of the time they are conditions of a relationship, of a covenant. You are with me, I am with you. You fear me, this is what I do. I will bless those who fear me. The Lord's 
eyes run to and fro seeking those who fear the Lord. The, uh, the, the, the angel of the Lord is uh, encamping and protecting those who fear the Lord. So you have so many promises that comes with the conditions. And this type of promises come with, a pro with the conditions here. If you, if, if it says, he is with you while you are with him. While you seek to abide in me, remain in him connected, I and you. This is a certain guarantee, but, but there is a but also, if you forsake him, he will forsake you. So when it says that he will forsake you, it's not that he's going to reject you and send you to hell. It's not what we're talking about. It's about the presence of the Lord effect being with you or not being with you. Having the Lord's presence to bless you, your family, your needs, guiding you, making you feel satisfied, peaceful in your home or something, or living on your own and on your own stress and on your own tiredness and on your own effort, trying, trying, like, like the prophet Agai was telling to the people of Israel, you are building homes, you are sowing your fields, but it's, you, the bag that you are uh, harvesting with is, is broken and you are missing out. You are working, you are earning money, but you are wasting your money immediately. You are not, not able, you are not, not blessed. You work hard, but you get a little. So what the Lord is, is suggesting to you and me this morning is like, do less, get more. That is what he is actually telling us this, this morning. So there is a, a condition to this uh, promise here. Now if you look at verse 3, for a long time Israel was without the true God, without a teaching priest, without the law. But when in their distress they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him, he was found by, by them. What the prophet is telling him, do you remember what the kingdom was like before you became king? Do you remember what your life was like before you became a Christian? Do you remember moments of your life when, when God was not directly uh, helping you? And then you have a description of, of that uh, uh, society or that time. They were without God, without a teaching, without law. But in their distress, they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him, and he was found by them. Happily, God is always ready to be found, even though we often err or uh, don't keep this fire or this zeal, and sometimes we go to different ways and get distracted or something. But as soon as you and I, we will come back to the Lord, the Lord reassure us always that he was there waiting all along, that he will let us find him again. Amen? Hallelujah. This is an accurate picture of our society, but also of many, unfortunately, Christian homes. <clears throat> there is so much that is out of order. Um, there is so much lack of authority, lack of peace and quietness in home, conflicts. Everyone wants to do what pleases them, and many families become dysfunctional. Because that is a dysfunctional society that is uh, described over here. If you look at verse, go to the next slide, verse 5. In those times, no peace, a great turmoil, confusion, trouble on all the inhabitants. They were broken, bruised, crushed, for God troubled them with every adversity. So it's unfortunate that some people can live like that when they could live and and perfect peace and contentment and 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 the way that would be like, you know when jesus and it says in the bible makes his path straight you know you have valleys and mountains but it says makes your path straight smooth it's easier to walk you know many of you like to do hiking in hong kong some of you don't like to go to wuoi and long Ke. Because it goes up and down, it's very hard. And some of them have been <laughs> puffing. But what, you know, the part that you are walking straight is pretty easy, isn't it? It's just the last part that is being hard. So it's a little bit like this: walking with the Lord. You walk in the same direction, but one one walks and is puffing through, is is going, but the other one walks. It's, it's a smooth, it's a smooth walk because God is part of, of that of that journey. 
It doesn't have to be uh, messy, dysfunctional, and, and, and lacking peace. It should be blessed under the Lord in our home, in our marriage, in our families. Everywhere we are, we should be an instrument of peace. Second Chronicle, verse 7. Here is the promise again. The next uh, click. As for you, be strong and courageous, for your work will be rewarded. You will bear much fruit. Be, for you, choose, decide what you want. You want to remain. You want God's presence. Hold on to Jesus. Connect with the Lord. Don't go into any directions without making sure you, the Lord is with you, blessing your, your life, your choices and decisions. Be courageous for your work will be rewarded. You will bear much fruit and my father will be glorified. When Asa heard this message from Azariah the prophet, he took courage. So this morning, if you are struggling and you feel away from the Lord and things are not working, there's a lot of conflicts and tiredness and emptiness, discontentment in your life, don't lose courage because God is always there, ready to let you find him again and bring you back into his blessing. He is not a punishing God. The, God describes himself slow to anger, rich and unfailing love. That's what he is. But at the same time, we have a side. We have some of our decision to make. And God says, you make the decision for me. I'm going to overflow my blessing over you. It's like Jesus is telling us, seek the Lord with your whole heart and he will come to you with his presence. And your life will be filled of the power of God. It will irradiate from your life. So this promise is really conditional. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. It's conditional, but I know that this morning, it is your desire. It is your desire to have the power of God and to abide in the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Many people, when they come to Christ, at beginning is a great uh, initial zeal that they have, an expression of faith. Yet over time, this is the story of most Christians, or many Christians, over time these zeals wears off and they begin to neglect the Lord. Yet many people who are falling away from the Lord still believe that God's presence remains with them no matter what, which is a lie and a del delusion according to what we just read in uh, in second chronicle if you forsake him he will forsake you if a man abide not what happened he cannot bear fruits he's being cut he's being thrown away he's being burned this is the same thing so there is a condition here so that god is not uh, uh, okay jesus says it in a different way in the book of revelation hot or cold if you are lukewarm i will spit you out this is another way to to look at it if, if you want to walk with god walk with god if you don't want god then know know what's happening know what's going to happen and it's not that god rejects you forever it's the best w things if your heart is not there he cannot be in if your ears are not open to him he cannot speak to you if your eyes are not on him, he cannot guide you. That's why it says, abide in me, so that I can fully speak to you, fully lead you, fully be in your heart, fully help you with your daily situation with your life, because I love you. That's, that's what it is all about. And the amazing promise we saw last week about ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is uh, amazing. So if you combine these two promises, this is like, wow, again. Can you say wow this morning? Wow. I with you, and ask whatever you want, and it will be done for you. By this, you will be my disciple. By this, my Father will be glorified. By this, you will bear much more fruit. That is what it is all about. What your life should be like individually and in your family and as a church, uh, as a, our influence into, into this world. Amen. Hallelujah. Otherwise, sin separates and separates us from the blessing of the Lord. In closing, Brother Stephen, would you please prepare? We will sing at the closing. Just come right now. Many Christians have experienced the presence 
of God. Like all of us at different times in our life, we have experienced uh, answer to prayer. We have experienced God being with us, the closeness of the Lord. But there is still one thing that not many of us have experienced. It's the glory of the Lord. There's dif a difference here. You, you, you understand what I'm saying. We, we, we are Christians. We walk with Christ. 50%, 70%, we, we, God is answering, we have some blessing in our lives, we have ups and downs. But not many of us have experienced the glory of, have seen the glory of the Lord. Moses has seen the glory of the Lord. But many of us have not seen the glory of the Lord in actions in our life. Or like the church reflecting the glory of the Lord. Or your life and my life reflecting the glory of the Lord. To the point where we read in the book of Acts, you know, the miracles that it was taking place and people were in awe and things like this. The supernatural hand of the Lord guiding, blessing and filling the things that we do for him because he's requiring uh, that of us. And the secret is found in John chapter 15. If we want to see and experience the glory of God, the secret is to maintain the presence of God in our life. Amen? Would you stand? I will ask the musician this morning to sing, the back voice, to sing the song, but not to display the words. No words. So that you can close your eyes. They will sing the songs, but that you may dwell for a moment in the quiet and the secret place in the cleft of the rock, you and the Lord push the pause button this morning and think about the remaining, the remaining